Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Cash Rules Podcast. My name is Keith Smith, and I'm here with my co-host. Fabian Rodin. What's up, people? He's the head of research, educational program development specialist here. And we're here with a very special guest. He's actually the the editor-in-chief at Investopedia. His name is Caleb Silver. But I want to start off by making sure that we are all aware that None of what we are discussing today should be taken as legal, financial, and or tax advice. Instead, the objective of our conversation today is to highlight some of the unspoken rules in finance, discuss why some of these concepts go unspoken, and what we can be doing on a practical level to change that reality in an informational, educational capacity. With that said, Fabian, how are you doing today? Less than highly favored. How are you doing, sir? I'm absolutely incredible. Awesome, awesome, awesome. We have a wonderful guest here. I mean, he's going to bring so much knowledge, so much. Hi- he's going to highlight the exact things we kind of need to know. This is what we're here for. Cash rules is all about the money. If it ain't about the money, don't, it don't mean nothing. And I'm glad to bring him on. Mr. Silver, how are you doing today? I'm fully blessed. Fully, <laughs> be, 100%. So good to be with you guys. I love what you're doing. And it's an honor to be here. Thank you for inviting me. The honor is all ours. Thank you so much. All right, man, for sure. So, Caleb, let's get this thing started. We don't want to spend too much time with the chit chat. So tell us, man, tell us a little bit about your background, um, where are you based right now, and what have you been doing up to what you now do on a daily basis? Yeah, well, that's tough to keep it short, but I'm going to keep it short. Uh, I am in uh, central Harlem near Strivers Row. Shout out Dipset. Shout out to my people up in Harlem. I've been (laughs) in New York City for about 26 years. Um, Grew up in New Mexico, uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, but New York is my town. New Mexico is my state. Um, And I started out in the restaurant business. I did 12 years in the restaurant game when I was growing up in New Mexico, everything you can imagine, managing, busboy, cooking, uh, growing up as a, you know, in that business really taught me about small businesses, but it also taught me that I don't, didn't want to do that forever. I taught myself how to shoot uh, a television camera. I bought a TV camera with my, my tips from waiting tables. I started working in news as a stringer, as a camera operator. Then I started producing documentaries. I took myself all the way down through Central and South America, hitchhiking uh, on boats, in the back of trucks, on top of buses. Uh, doing environmental educational documentaries, met my wife down there, uh, came back to the U.S. and went to grad school for journalism. Uh, She is from South America. My wife, she moved with me to New York City. That's how we got here. Uh, We went to grad school, started working in journalism, still as a camera operator. And then I started doing a little news production and some more documentary work. Eventually was hired at Bloomberg when they were just starting Bloomberg TV back in the late 90s, right as the internet bubble was forming, I got to produce a a segment on internet stocks just as that that bubble was ready to pop, learned so much in that crash and stayed with Bloomberg for about eight years, which was a great education into business and business journalism. Eventually was hired over to CNN, worked there for 10 years in a variety of capacities, ran business news for CNN, but also helped launch the situation with Wolf Blitzer, ran CNN Money, uh, CNN Money Video. And then... uh, moved over to Investopedia about six and a half, seven years ago, because I was just fascinated with Investopedia. I'd used it forever as a business journalist. And when they were hiring, um, and I realized that they were owned by IAC, our grandparent company, I was super interested. Went there thinking I'd be there six months, six and a half years later. Here I am, editor-in-chief of Investopedia, talking to y'all, but it's been a long and interesting road for me. Wow. Well said. Well said. Oh, he has the bio in his back pocket ready to go at all times. I love it. <laughs> when you get to be my age, you need to be able to remember these things quickly. Sometimes I have to write it on a cheat sheet. And and it all flows for the most part. I mean, maybe like going to South America, shooting documentaries, it was probably hard to know like what was going to come exactly after that. But from there, it seems, you know, once you started working with, with Bloomberg was the first one right around finance. That's it's a clear path to the top, right? That is the top. <laughs> so, yeah. and yeah. it was a real intense place to to learn business journalism. They're very strict about it in a good way. Uh, so you learn a lot of great skills and fundamentals there. But it was really the storytelling aspect that got me into it. I was a camera operator, so I got, you know, I was getting paid to to shoot. But when they realized I could produce, 
I like the story of money. And that's sort of been the through line through my career. It's not just the stock market or the economy. It's the story of money and all of its manifestations, how we operate around it, how it affects us as, as human beings, but also how money works and how businesses work. I'm fascinated with that part. And that sort of kept me going for 26 years in this industry. Love it. Love it. So, so yeah, I mean, I feel like I, I just, there's so many questions that I could ask, but so being at that forefront of business journalism like that, what are like some of the key takeaways that you feel like someone who is watching would never know unless they saw some of like what you were doing behind the scenes? Well, first I'll shout out the woo because it's cream. Cash rules everything around me, you and everybody else. <laughs> Um, I love it. But what I also realized is that, you know, the emperor has no clothes a lot of the time. So financial media loves to talk above people. And we like to use a lot of jargon and we like to impress people with, you know, our quantitative stats and our deep research and, um, you know, regression analysis and everything. But at the end of the day, people are people. And there are some experts in this industry, don't get me wrong. At the same time, as you can see with the stock market and the economy we're going on right now, a lot of people predicted this wrong. And a lot of them are highly paid professionals who get paid to do this. So the emperor has no clothes a lot of the time. Sometimes we're just you know, reacting to our animal instincts, our animal spirits, as we call them in this business. And there is a way to sort of cut through all of that nonsense by talking to people like people and actually using financial literacy and financial education as that way to get in that door. And once people understand it and demystify it, it's accessible to anybody. Wealth building is accessible to anybody. Now, more accessible to people like me than has been to communities like the ones that you guys grew up in for sure. But in today's 21st century with technology and everything else, it's accessible to everybody, but we all have to start with the foundation of knowledge. Very true. Very true. Love it. And so talk a little bit about the technology aspect. I mean, you've seen um, the changes, right, around not only in media, right? Talk a little bit about how the media has changed, right, around tech, and then maybe talk to us about how you've seen that also change the world of finance. Yeah, great question. And we could start right away with just talking about what's on our in our hands or in our back pockets most of the time, because you can do any financial transaction you want with your phone right now. That was a very big deal 12 years ago. When that came out, people don't realize that wasn't around, you know, during the last real bear market uh, or the one in 1999. So that's a big deal. But also information moves a lot quicker and there's so much more information. And guess what? So much information used to just be generated from Wall Street or Canary Wharf in London or Frankfurt or, you know, the financial centers of the world. That information is coming from everywhere all the time. You guys are producing great information. Um, my buddy, Josh Brown, he's got a huge, like a media company inside his wealth management company, producing a lot of information. My buddies, Troy and Rashad at Earn Your Leisure, producing a lot of great information. Ian Dunlap, like it's coming from everywhere right now. So the volume of information is intense. The sources of it have quad, you know multiplied extensively. So you have to be able to see through it. And there is not that, source of the gospel like there was when I was coming up, which is, well, what does Goldman Sachs think? Or what does Merrill Lynch think? Well, guess what? Merrill Lynch barely even around part of Bank of America now. But my point is, it's information is everywhere. And there is no authority except the people you choose to gravitate towards. Love that. And, and so how do you, besides maybe just, oh, I gravitate toward this, because I mean, one of the biggest like potential pitfalls is that we only listen to what we want to listen to as well. Um, how do we come up with better ways to filter out like who to listen to in a time like this? It's a great question. Uh, we hear what we want to hear and disregard the rest as Simon and Garfunkel used to sing, because we, that's what we do. It's what, it's one of our, uh, behavioral instincts, like, like, likes, like, you know, um, if it, you know, he went to the same school as me, or I like the way he comes across on TV, or I like the suits that he wears, I'm going to start listening to him, or you get the point. The point is, I've diversified my learning sources by following other people that didn't come up the same path as I did. And it just makes me smarter. So I mentioned uh, Earn Your Leisure. Uh, I mentioned um, Ian. I mentioned, I haven't mentioned others, but there are plenty of people like that, that I wasn't listening to three, four, 10, 15 years ago. 
they didn't have the platforms that they had. So that's a big deal. But Twitter and especially financial Twitter has also changed a lot of that as well. And the social media platforms, because if you follow FinTwit, like I follow FinTwit, all of a sudden it went from, you know, maybe a couple thousand of us to hundreds of thousands or millions of people that are all sort of passionate about money or investing in some way, shape or form, but everybody's got a different take on it. So I like to look at the folks who do technical analysis. There's a whole group of people there. Fundamental analysis, sentiment, mood, behavior. I look at it all and I follow people who, uh, the people that I think are great and I look at who they're following and I start to follow them as well. I love it. I love it. I love the idea of FinTwit. It's such a big thing today, right? Like, and in fact, I mean, it's one of those good sources, right, to actually go to, to start to filter a little bit of maybe what you want to see. So it's a great suggestion. Great, great point that you made there. Um, who are some of the people that you follow in, in the FinTwit sphere? Well, on the research side, I follow a lot of the top strategists that you might expect me to follow, but uh, across Wall Street, but also in the in the wealth management space, a lot of good um, education coming out of that space. I also follow just the straight up influencers, Kyla Scanlon, someone I follow. Uh, oh, I, I follow, uh, I, I love uh, the trapper uh, just because he's got so much personality. He's so, so energetic and he's got some really interesting uh, investing and trading principles that he follows as well. My buddy, Terry Gioma, trade and travel. She's great. Uh, she's more of a trader. Um, but I also am following people who are talking about investing, not in the, in the, and the up and down ticks of the stock market, but holistically. So, um, so uh, Michael Batnick, the Irrelevant Investor, someone I really enjoy following, Ben Carlson, his partner. Uh, they have a, a, a podcast together called Animal Spirits. They're always putting out interesting research. Charlie Bellello from Compound Advisors. Great statistics on what's happening in the market and, and giving us that 50,000-foot uh, flyover. So we get trapped up in the day-to-day -day ups and downs of the market. When you look at the market and pull it back a few years or you go back in time, uh, you start to see some interesting patterns there. Ryan Dietrich from Carson, uh, the Carson Group, one of my favorites. So I got a handful, but if you follow me, and look who I follow, you're gonna see some gems there because I've taken a long time to, to, to uh, cultivate the people that I like to follow. Love it, man. That's so much value to our viewers. So I really appreciate that, even to me. Um, so I wanna zoom out a little bit, step back some, because now we're talking about like really deep what it looks like today to keep up with everything that's happening in the financial world. But I wanted to ask you, you know, you did spend a lot of time in the traditional TV media outlets. And you the thing is, is you were kind of in control of that. You're the producer there. So you had a lot of say in like what was happening. But you know, I'm still you know, there were still the constraints of like how people were viewing it. So tell us a little bit about as a producer, like what were some of the biggest changes that you had to make in the way that you started to present? information as you went from Bloomberg, CNN, to a internet first platform like Investopedia? Yeah, that is a great question. I love it because there's something super unique about Investopedia that makes it so different from everywhere else I've worked. I came out of the news business. You're right. The news business is what? It's a push medium. Extra, extra. Read all about it. Look over here. We have the latest. This just in. Breaking news. Exclusive. You're getting people to try to pay attention to you by putting up the flares. That's push. Investopedia is a search plat. You know, people come to us via search most of the time. It's a pull platform. In other words, we're not, we're doing news. We do a fair amount of news and we flag it out there. But most of the time people come with an intention. The intention could be anything. And it could be something like, how do I invest $1,000, Roth IRA or 401k? Which online brokerage should I use if I want to trade options? What does pr price to earnings ratio mean? People have millions of questions. We have millions of readers. They all come to us with a specific intent. So in that way, we're not pushing it at them. We're pulling them in. How are we pulling them in? By trying to understand intent and then write our stories or our definitions or our explainers or our Q&As in a way that's going to attract that question. We want the best answer to that question. And we think long and hard, and we do a lot of data science around what is the manifestation of that question that will bring people to this article if written properly, structured correctly, and tagged the right way. That is a completely different set of tools and muscles that you need to use as an editor in my shop versus what I was doing at CNN or Bloomberg. 
Love it, man. I've, I've been a huge uh, user of Investopedia. Like I've, and that's another thing, right? Like I'm not a, just a viewer, there, just yeah. a reader. Like I use it like a dictionary. <laughs> like, um, you know, this week, everyone was talking about the cable. I was like, what the hell? What is the cable? <laughs> and so got to Investopedia, started realizing, okay, this is what people are referring to as the GU pair. And not only that, but there was a, a transatlantic cable that was laid across the ocean back in the day. And I've, I studied that stuff around just like the telegraph and like what was happening, you know, how the internet kind of has its roots today. So I thought that was super fascinating that that is where the definition comes from. But um, I wanted to follow up on that because one of the things that um, I think we all kind of are observing about traditional media today, too, is that headlines, right, are like this way to, you know, get people's attention and, and quite frankly, potentially manipulate the thoughts of certain mm -hmm. people who might not click in and read more. How can people in the financial world that are trying to make financial decisions, like, think more prudently about headline writing and things like that? Mm -hmm. Great, great question. And, and I'm going to be a little bit crude here, but I think it's important. Um, that type of headline, uh, you know, clickbait, we like to call it, is a little bit like porn. You kind of know it when you see it, right? And if it's, if it feels like it, you know, how this 34 year old makes $60,000 a year and retired at 28, uh, not pointing fingers at anybody, but you know what I'm talking about. Those articles are more than a dime a dozen. They're out there. If I had a nickel for every one of those, I'd be a very wealthy man. And in fact, I'm doing just fine. But the point is, there is that. And then there is, when you're asking the internet a question, when you're at going into your search engine or whatever that is, and you're saying, you really have a specific question. Like I said, how do I start investing with $10,000? We get that question tens of thousands of times a month for people who I really want to start investing. You better have the best answer for them. That is not Here's how this guy started investing $10,000 a month. And now he drives this sweet car and he's got these girlfriends and he's got this house in Malibu. That's not what we're talking about. We're trying to get to the core of what people actually want. So we don't play that game at all because it ruins your reputation for one. And it's just a slimy way to do content and try to educate people. On the other hand, I understand media. I understand that that's a business. And you know we've probably had more than one egregious headlines in my time here at Investopedia and certainly in the 23 years we've been around. But for people uh, listening to this that are looking for information, ask questions. You know, if you ask, a, you know, ask the right question and then look at the answers that are being delivered to you on the search results page. And you're going to be able to tell pretty much right away which one is actually speaking the truth to what you're actually asking. And that's how you disseminate the good from the bad, because everybody wants to get your attention. And there's nothing worse than a, a slimy, clicky headline uh, you know, that's clickbait. And then you get there and there's no calories. That's a, what the Blues Brothers called a wish sandwich when you have two pieces of bread and you wish you had some meat. I love that. I love that. So what would you consider to be what is the impact of media in the world of finance then? It's massive. Look at what was going on in uh, 2020 with the meme stocks. Now, that was media that was traditional financial media the cable channels that i that i uh, like and enjoy they were participating in that investopedia was writing about that but the media that i'm talking about there was user generated media coming from um uh reddit and wall street mm -hmm. bets and other forums which is good i love to see the public talking to each other and people educating one another now that can also get to mania level and we saw exactly what happened there so media has now gone way outside of CNBC, Bloomberg, Fox Business News, The Wall Street Journal, Barron's, et cetera, to where uh, you know it's being generated by individuals, not just influencers, but anybody who has access to these forums. So you have to be careful about that because now the opinions, you know, some good, some bad, have been you know multiplied intensively. So you have to know who to listen to. So it's done a lot in that. But also, if you think about the way, and I'll tighten this up a little bit, but if you're thinking about the way that business is covered on television, just for example, it's covered like a sports event, right? The pregame, the pre-market, you know, the kickoff, the opening bell, halftime report, um, you know, you know, well, you know, final quarter, closing bell, post-game report, you know, they cover it like that. They realized a long time ago that that works and it draws people in during the day. Most of the people watching business news television are my age and older, 
who are you know managing money or have it absently on or it's on at work or they're using it to you know as part of their business it's not everybody but that is the way that it has been covered in the past now i see that it's being because it's every everybody has access to create their own you see it in all different shapes and sizes and if you go to tiktok you'll know exactly what i'm talking about very true I love it. I love it. Yeah, I did want to say something because this is like a more out there kind of question, but I know you're you're in New York. So I know you know the game of betting, right? There's so many people out here that are betting and putting so much effort into um on on sports, by the way, into learning about parlays. Um, you know, how to do all of these things that are I think, imagine, I imagine they're pretty helpful if you wanted to actually apply those types of strategies to your portfolio, your investment portfolio. Talk to us a little bit like about how you look at the world of betting versus the world of investing. And like, it's a very personal question, but I'd love to get your personal thoughts. Yeah, it's a great question. Betting and trading are twins, basically. You know, they grow up in the same house. Um Betting and investing are very different. And we'll talk about the difference between you know short-term investing and long-term investing. But when I talk about investing, I'm generally talking about long-term investing, trying to build wealth for the long-term, for whatever purpose, retirement, purchase of a home, take care of family members, whatever you want. Betting and trading are very similar. And things like parlays or, or um, you know playing odds, that's what's happening in the options market. That's what's happening in day trading. That's what's happening in hedge strategies or swing trading because you're betting on timeframes, you're betting on potential outcomes, and you're getting basically percentages either way, odds either way, and pricing based upon that that uh, what could happen in the options market in a way that you might get in a multi-game parlay or a multi-factor parlay in a sports event. So it's very similar. There are factors at play, there is time, and there is an event. And that is what sports betting is premised on. And the same thing is happening in the options and derivatives markets um, and a lot in the crypto market as well. There's a lot of that going on and they are very similar. Investing for the long-term is completely different. And uh, I would say that the betting and the trading are more emotionless, even though people get worked up into it because it's money we're talking about and people are very emotional about it. But investing for the long term is about education, learning. It's about the journey, getting to the to that place, and it never ends, by the way. But it's a it's a little bit you know you're a little bit more invested in it because you devoted the time to research it. Right, right, and I and I think this kind of goes side to side in terms of your most recent um, episode on Investopedia, uh, right, which expressed the, I guess the the meaning of the secret sauce behind um, the world's greatest investors, right? What are some some of your key takeaways from that on um, that episode? Yeah, that episode I was interviewing David Rubenstein, who was the co-founder of the Carlyle Group, one of the biggest private equity firms in the world, and he's interviewed a lot of great investors like I have. So we were talking about the, those characteristics, and those characteristics, and I'll just name a few. He has thirteen in the book. Are patience, um, curiosity, intellectual curiosity, um, uh, the ability to have multiple or to change your mind. I can't stress how important that is because when you're an investor. You have to have the ability to hold your conviction strongly, but be ready to change your mind if things change. That's a very big deal. But also a passion for things outside of the of the, the things that you grew up learning about and knowing about. So being able to say, look, I don't know a lot about railroads, but I'm going to do my best to learn about them. You mentioned uh, Keith learning about cable. Yeah, you, you were looking up something else and you went down that rabbit hole. Now you know a lot more about it than you did before. It's that ability to green light yourself to say, I actually want to learn more about this because it may improve my ability to make a decision here. And I think those are some of those characteristics. And you got to be, you got to be a risk taker in some cases. And I'm not talking about betting the farm, but being able to go, uh, you know, left zig when others are zagging. That's a very big uh, deal when it comes to having a character trait that makes a successful investor. And I guess I might be jumping ahead in this next question, but I think it might be coincided to what your answer was. What are some of the things you might tell a person who is just now getting into this um, in terms of investing that might seem it to be in monstrous or boring? Like, what are some of those key takeaways you tell them? Yeah, I tell them, and I was just talking talking about this on Instagram Live because I got the same question, which is 
right now, especially with the stock market as, as messy as it is, but also in a bear market, it's a great time to be putting stocks on your watch list, trying to line up the companies you might want to invest in or start investing in them in dollar cost averaging. But what do you need to do to do that? You need to look for companies that are really healthy right now. And that means looking into their balance sheets. What's cash flow like? What's revenue like? Is it recurring? Is it lumpy? Is it up and down? Are they able to bring that revenue to the bottom line in terms of free cash flow and er uh, earnings per share and return that to investors in the form of a dividend? or in the form of buying back more stock or just an appreciation of the share price. So now is a great time to find quality companies. That requires research. That requires understanding balance sheets and learning about it. But guess what? It's fun to learn about it. And the more you learn about it, the more you start getting interested in other companies and other industries. So you have to do that homework and then find those characteristics and assemble a watch list of stocks that are that are, have a lot of the same things in their favor. We call those factors. And that takes education and time, but that's the fun part. So what advice do you have around what's happening in the economy right now? Like what can the average person do to, to prepare to, for the turbulent um, times ahead? Yeah, well, the first thing I gotta say is if you don't have some savings, and I'm not talking about two weeks, I'm talking about six months, uh, you know, if things really got nasty here and you potentially lost your job, if the worst thing happened, would you be okay? Would your household be okay? Because you have to make sure you have that in check. Otherwise, nothing else matters, right? So you got to have that. Let's assume that you have that and you're in a comfortable spot and your job is secure and you're in a comfortable, safe uh, living environment. As it comes to investing, we say the best day to start investing was yesterday. The next best day is today. And what do I mean by that? I don't know if the market's bottoming out here. I don't know if it's about to go up 50%. I have no idea. What I do know is the stock market on average returns about 9% a year, year after year after year for about the last 65 years. I have another 25 years to invest at least. I'm continuing to invest. So a little bit at a time. And I don't care if we're at a high or a low. I'm dollar cost averaging and I'm buying every couple of weeks on regularity because I'm getting a good average price. And now with the market's nice and low, I'm getting stocks hopefully at a discount. And I think there's going to be a recovery. And I don't know when that's going to be, but I want to make sure that I have... I have positions at these prices because I do believe over time the stock market goes up. And if you don't believe me, just look at the stock market over the last 100 years and Very you'll true. see an up and to the right with some drops in between. That's what a uh, market is. So outside of Investopedia, what do you think are some of the most important tools for investors to get access to? I think that uh, uh, screening tools um, to be able to Look at stocks and screen stocks or ETF or index funds to compare them against one another are super important. And you can find those on any online broker. Um, we, are, we have a stock simulator on Investopedia. If you want to learn how to invest or trade for free, harmless, it's a paper trading platform. It's one of the most popular parts of our site. It's our stock trading uh, simulator. You'll see it on our homepage. Uh, people, 30 to 50,000 people are going there every month and learning and starting to learn how to trade and invest. So you can Try your hand without losing any money there. I would do that. Make sure you have an ability to screen and the and access to research. And guess what? You don't need a, a, a $2,000 a month Bloomberg terminal. It's free on the internet. There's so much free uh, uh, online education for finance right now. And you could start on Investopedia because guess what? It's free, but every there's so many sites, Yahoo Finance, CNBC, Bloomberg itself, uh, even the, 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 the brokers themselves have good educational resources these days. So that's what I would make sure you have a screener, the ability to practice, and then the ability to access research and all that is free. Love it, man. And I wanted to go ahead and ask you a personal question about how you manage some of your portfolio. Tell us, what is the riskiest move that you have made with your portfolio? And how did you justify that? Yeah, I'm going to tell you about the biggest mistake I ever made, which is also the riskiest move I ever made, which Fair. is why I don't buy individual stocks anymore. I'm not allowed to. Um, I, in the great financial crisis, I was watching Lehman Brothers, which is, you know, a, a hundred year old investment bank you know, worth $80 billion, I was watching that stock just fall out of the sky. Why? Lehman had underwritten a lot of bad uh, credit, a lot of bad debt. Uh, and, and Loans and everything. Yep. Loans, collateralized debt obligations, they, and a lot of other banks, but they were excessive about it. And I watched the stock of Lehman Brothers go from 80 to 50 to 40 to 30 to 20. Eventually, I said, this is Lehman Brothers. There's no way Lehman Brothers is going out of business. And right. there's no way the Federal Reserve and the Treasury is going to let that happen. And I was dead wrong. I followed that stock from 
80 to, to zero, basically. I still have, I keep it in my portfolio as a bankrupt ticker. It's a five letter ticker now, just to remind myself that I'm not allowed to do that anymore. Cause I'm a business journalist. I was like, there's no way this is happening. I'm smarter than everybody else. No, no, that hurt. And that was about 10 G's. And at that time for me, that was a lot of money. Um, so I wrote that, <laughs> I wrote that right to the bottom. Uh, and I still feel it and I make myself look at it. I, I will not sell the 17 cents worth that are still in my portfolio. So that's a big mistake I made. I also, you know, I bet on sectors when I thought things were going to pop hard, but I've always made sure that when I make a new bet, it's never more than 5% of my portfolio because I've, I've paid the price for that. So I diversify pretty heavily right now. I got, I, I invested heavily in the cannabis sector when things couldn't have been hotter in that sector three or four years ago. Most of those stocks are down 70, 80%. When a stock yep. goes down 35%, guys, it takes a 50% rise to bring it back to where it was. When a stock goes down 75%, uh, 50%, I should say, it takes 100% to get it back to where it was. When a stock goes down 80%, you might just need to fold. I love that. That's awesome. Awesome. Thank Words you so of much. There. Yeah, uh, that that's something that is so important for investors to understand. Like, I've been around a lot of people in the in the digital asset space, and you've got these huge swings all the time. And I think people don't understand that that when you come down, right, you have to have that much more of an impact on the way up, and you and you need to have a reason, right, for things to come up. Which in that space, right there's a lot less of a potential reason, right? There's nothing that's necessarily there underlying. That's that's the problem. And crypto too, and I, I invest in crypto, but not more than for me, 2% of my portfolio. But I want to know the space. I want to be in it. If I feel like there's a lot of momentum, maybe I'll increase that, but it will never be more than 5%. So and we and we usually do our best to completely avoid talking about crypto on the show, because I think um, most of the times we just want to make sure that we're like hearing from the right people around it or like from the right perspective. And I think this is a great one because you're an investor, you're thinking about this from a risk perspective, right? And I think that's super important. Talk to us a little bit about your thoughts around also how you see the technology playing a role in society, but talk to us about how investors should be looking at crypto, although you gave us a little bit there. Yeah, I'll give you a little bit more because it's taken me time to come around to this. I finally have talked to enough smart people to realize the potential of the blockchain, the potential of non-fungible tokens. And I'm not talking about things to trade. I'm talking about the utilitarian aspect of it, the practical yes. use of it in society today. And what I understand well now, just by reading and talking to enough smart people, is that the blockchain itself is like the highway, right? It's the big highway that's being built for Web3 and the next generation of how we're going to interact with technology and basically live our lives and our kids. My kids are already living in it. The tokens and the coins are like cars on that highway, right? And some are Ferraris and some look like spaceships and may go to the moon and then disappear into outer space forever, like some of the coins that we know. <laughs> and some are really smart vehicles that are kind of humming along and doing some work on the highway themselves. And those are the smart coins. You know, people talk about Ethereum in that respect. Um, so I understand that now. And I get the mania around tradable things because I understand, you know, in the 16th century, 17th century, it was tulips. And I understand that in the 20th century, at the end of it, it was internet stocks. And then it was, you know, cannabis stocks. I understand manias. I get it. It was railroad stocks, PS, at the end of the, uh, the, at the beginning of the 20th century. It's always something. And things get out of hand because, like I said, we're animals and our spirits get a hold of us. But once I understood that better, then I stopped thinking that I should be betting on the, on the cars themselves. There's a couple of cars, vehicles on that highway that I think will be here in 10 years. And I'm invested in those. I think they serve a purpose. The rest of it, it to me, is fugazi, as McConaughey said in uh, in uh, <laughs> uh, the Wolf of Wall Street. Right? It's fairy dust. Woo but the rest of it, but the I do believe in the promise of decentralized finance and the blockchain, and we can get into the industries that I think it's going to be super important for, if you like. I'd like to ask you a question. Now you talked about dividend stocks, right? What? is the percentage or a gold percentage people should actually be looking for when they are looking into um, purchasing dividend stocks? 
Yeah. Well, you want to look at companies that are kicking off a handsome dividend and they haven't been cutting it over time. And what is a handsome dividend? Typically, you're not going to get more than you know two three percent. Some companies pay up to a five percent dividend. Some companies pay an eight or nine percent dividend. Yeah. But the reason that they're paying that high dividend is because their business is inherently risky and it's a carrot to lure investors in. And sometimes it makes a lot of sense. And companies can you know have gone on for decades paying a very high dividend. But you want to see that it's stable over time. You want to make sure that the dividend payout ratio is attractive and you can screen for that. Look at companies that have a consistent dividend payout ratio to know, am I getting a, 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 an adequate reward for the risk that I'm taking with this company? And if you look at that right dividend ratio and you find a couple in the sweet spot there, um, then line up a bunch of companies across sectors, but especially now, given the fact that the economy is slowing, man, we may enter a recession, we're in a bear market that I would look at the companies that do better in this type of an environment. And those are consumer staples. Um, those can also be in the healthcare sector. And during these slow economic times, utilities always pay handsome dividends because they just generate cash flow, recurring cash flow over time. They don't grow like weeds. They just kind of steady and eddy moving along. Mm -hmm. I would look at those types of companies now and the dividends or the dividend paying companies in those sectors that are, you know, like I said, stable. I love it. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, I wanted to step back for a second and go back to something you talked about earlier. Um, and it was some of the like GameStop, Reddit uh, sort of behavior. And the reason I wanted to go back to that specifically is I wanted to get your advice on, you know, a lot of people are coming into the game of investing and they're seeing these platforms, these Robin Hoods of the world. And they're like, oh, this is, it's just, it's been an on-ramp is the thing. And my question to you is like, what are your thoughts on using platforms like Robinhood as an on-ramp, taking into account also the some of what happened a year and a half ago or whenever that was now, and then like the whole payment for order flow situation, like how can we, as, as someone who wants to come into the game, like make better decisions around where to start? Okay, let's start with payment for order flow because that is... Uh... It's a little bit of a stigma across the industry. What is payment for order flow? That's a broker like Robinhood is getting its trades executed by another broker. In this case, it was it is Citadel, one of the biggest market makers in the world. Uh, Citadel actually does the transaction. Robinhood is just the platform with a really pretty interface, great software, um, great user experience. But the trades are being generated through um, Citadel and the trades are free for users, except for options and crypto, trades are free. Uh, why are trades free? They want to sell you other services, so they're going to make that part frictionless. So, But you have to have payment for order flow to some extent. It's got to be a reasonable amount of money. There's a toll booth there, right? Somebody's executing the trade. It's a toll. Uh, so you're going to pay that toll. When you rent a car, you're going to pay that fee, all those fees on there, even though you don't see them right away, but it's a part of the transaction. If you drive up here from... Uh, you know, well, Brooklyn, we don't have the toll, but if you were to come around on uh, on the Triborough, you'd pay a toll. Uh, so there's well, a not yet, fee. though. Not yet. Soon, soon. There'll yeah. be toes everywhere soon. <laughs> oh, no. Um, I'll be skateboarding across the Brooklyn Bridge in that case. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but payment for overflow is not going away, even though it's under a lot of scrutiny right now. And for retail investors, you, me, and your listeners, we're not trading, I don't think, 100,000 shares or a you know, a block of a, a million shares. We're just not that deep. So we really don't feel the payment for order flow. It's a fraction of a penny, right? Now, if you're doing a lot of trading and a lot of transacting, you'll feel it over time. But I'm telling you, you'd have to be in the millions for you to be even notice it on your on your statement and be like, well, I, what's this 30 bucks for? Well, you just traded $10 million, $10 million worth of share. So payment for order flow is here to stay. As for the platforms themselves, again, most of them, um, like Schwab, like Fidelity, you know, they're banks too. So they are fiduciaries, they're banks, they're regulated. Uh, Robinhood is regulated to a certain extent, but it is having its, its, its trades executed elsewhere. So you know, you're basically just borrowing the great technology in the interface. What I don't like about it is how it makes it like a game. And I've gotten a little bit be better about that at Robinhood. You know, the raining of confetti and balloons when you make a trade, I, it's not a game. Even though we call it a game and we think of it as a game, it's not. And to get that in people's minds where they're, in, where they're um, you know, get confetti thrown at them because they made a trade. Actually, they took a risk. So the, the gain is only when you make some money on that, when you, when you make that. a profit on that. So I don't like that aspect of it. They have gotten better about investor education and trading education, and they need to, and all of them need to. So these are all tools and platforms, but it really is, you know, 
on the user, it's on the customer, it's on the client to make sure they're educated before they get in too deep. And the way to not get in too deep is to not do things you don't understand. You don't need to start, you know, making call, uh, betting uh, call options or buying derivatives or playing the futures market. Buy some stock, buy some ETFs a little bit at a time. Uh, and see what that's like, see what it's like to own it, see what the transaction's like, because they're all really easy to use and trading is free. Love it, love it. And then just towards the, towards the end of this, I wanted to get, um, and you've, you've given out a lot of gems. So if this one doesn't come easy, I totally understand. But what is something that you think is the most important aspect of investing that no one ever really talks about. Yeah. Taxes. Uh, I, I don't think we talk enough about that. And especially for folks getting into this for the first time or people that you know started trading, not necessarily investing. You know, you got to remember, you got either short-term capital gains taxes or you got long-term capital gains taxes if you're making money uh, on your trades. And I think people forget about that. That's something that has to come out of your returns right? There's, that's one of them. So we don't talk enough about that. And, uh, you know, when you sign up for your 401k at work, or, you know, if you sign up for your own IRA, or if you have a small business start and start a SEP account, basically those are taxable. And when you finally need that money, you're going to, you know, you, you may, you look at your balance and be like, oh, I'm good. You know, I finally hit my goal. But just remember that as soon as you start selling, you're going to start paying taxes on that as well. So that's one thing. The other thing, I just want to mention real quick is this notion of the risk adjusted return. If you are making an investment or even a trade, what's your risk adjusted return? How much time are you going to be in that trade or that investment for? How much risk are you willing to take? And are you paying up for that risk? And then what is your expected return given those other two factors? And that sounds complicated, but it's actually not. How, you know, you talked about uh, companies, we talked about companies paying a high dividend. There's a reason. So risk adjusted return is a key fundamental thing that I think all investors need to think about. I'm going to do this because I think it's going to pay off in X amount of years. And I realize that I may lose this much if I do it, but the re potential return way outweighs the risk adjustments that I have to think about. I love that because that's one of the biggest things I kind of talk to my students, participants when talking about financial literacy. And I just want to go back and say, thank you for adding in a, um, uh, a stock stimulator into Investopedia because I used to start off with that as being a starting point. Like, let's play it as a game. Let's see if you get the fundamentals in terms of, of researching as well as understanding the, of the idea of investing. And then lastly, what I usually go to is taxes and understanding what are, what are called short-term and long-term holds and how that affects taxes. People might not understand that anything beyond the year your tax lesser than anything lesser than the year, right? So that is a big thing. I think that's something that's highlighted that I feel like everybody should know about before they even go into it. Yeah, can I say one more thing? Because this is go the ahead. one that gets me all the time. Because of what I do and because I've had so much time in the game, I get this all the time. Hey, Caleb, will you take a look at my portfolio and tell me what you think? And I'm happy to do it. I do it all the time. I'll do it for anybody. Um, but I have people that like to show me their stuff and they say, I have two of this and one of that and three of that and four of that. And they have like a, you know, they have a, you know, Smoke a Greek menu of, of stocks, stocks right? <laughs> but they own one share here, two shares. And I say, what's, you know, it's very hard to build wealth and get and compound the returns when you own a little bit of a lot of things. So sometimes people over diversify and I think that can be scary. But I say, if look, if you, let's just take Apple stock. If you, hey, I got three shares of Apple. What do you think? Hey, great. Depends on when you bought the stock uh, and compared to where the stock is. But if you really believe in Apple, why aren't you buying it every two weeks? And you don't have to buy a full share. You can buy fractional shares. So if you really believe in it and you really believe in like say 10 companies that you have in your portfolio because they represent a good, you know, relatively safe uh, investment over time in companies and industries that you believe in, then dollar cost average in. Keep buying it. Keep buying it. You got to build positions, not mm -hmm. one or two shares, positions to take advantage of the upside in order to take advantage of the real, the real magic of the stock market, which is compounding. So let me ask you as a follow-up to that and talk about ETFs a little bit. How important do you find it to invest in ETFs and should people gear more towards investing into ETFs than single bound um, stock? 
I believe in it. I've, I've built most of my portfolio around ETFs, and these are exchange traded funds for folks who don't know. These are baskets of stocks that trade like stocks every single minute of every single day, unlike a mutual fund, which only prices once a day. Um, so you're basically, if you say, look, I really think e-commerce has a chance. Well, yeah, it, it, it does have a chance. And it's been doing, you know, over the last decade. But let's say I believe in e-commerce. Amazon's the king of e-commerce. I know that. But what other companies are in that sector? And you can find ETFs, exchange traded funds that have 20 e-commerce companies. And some of them are not just delivery companies or fulfillment companies. Some of them are just on the warehousing side. Some of them are on the tech side. So if you want exposure to the sector, the ETF is a great way to do that. It also diversifies you right away. It also trades pretty actively. Now, a couple of things about ETFs. You got to make sure there's liquidity. You don't want to buy ETFs that have less than $50 million in them. They could go away tomorrow. You want to make sure you have ETFs that have a good balance of companies and that there's no one company in there that's outweighing the others so much that if something happens to that company, it brings the whole ETF down. And you want to make sure that you believe in the company bringing you the ETF. What's their track record of bringing ETFs to market? Those are all very important. But you can assemble a heck of a portfolio over time and keep buying into that ETF over time. Uh, if you want exposure to the stock market at large, SP, SPY, that's the S&P 500 ETF. If you just want the NASDAQ, QQQ, you just want the Dow, that's the Diamonds, DIA. So you can get these, you can get sectors, you can get indexes, you can get countries, you can get ETF for just about everything. I love it. I love it. Yep. And I think Fabian, it might be time. What do you think, man? What time? What time is it? Wrap it around. <laughs> <laughs> so Caleb, towards the end of these conversations, we like to just ask these questions and we just want to get the first thought that comes to your head. Don't think too hard. This is a no judgment zone. And we just want to get your 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 fresh thoughts. Yeah, no, not thinking too hard is not a problem for me. <laughs> <laughs> you got the right guy. As I said, I'm well cast. I love it. So to start off, tell us what is money? Money is the means to be able to control your time. It's a tool that allows you to control your time straight up. I love it. Absolutely. Tell us, Caleb, who inspires you the most, dead or alive? I'm going to go Bob Marley, just because he's one of my heroes. Um, and his music's been super important to me. So just in general, uh, I'm inspired by my wife. And hopefully she'll listen to this and that I can put that in the bank. But she is genuine, hardworking, smart, sincere, all those things. Um, but in, in the investing world, I, I've had a lot of inspirations, people I've learned a ton from. I mentioned some of the people I follow today, but if I think about the, you know, my uh, hall of fame, I'm going to put Charlie Munger in there. He is Warren Buffett's partner at Berkshire Hathaway. He's the vice chairman of Berkshire Hathaway, still the chairman or, or was until a few months ago, of the National Law Journal. Dude's like 98 years old, still going strong. And on our website, on my page, I have a quote from him that he told me in an interview, a candid interview we were having, we were actually talking about family, not money, where he said he has no room in his life for people who don't have the capacity to change. This was the guy, he was telling me this and he was about 88 years old. And he was like, 88, you feel like people aren't going to change? He's, he recognized even at that age that you have to have the ability to change your mind and be able to see things differently, even if... You come back to the same place. If you don't have the capacity for it, then you stop learning. And he's been an inspiration for me. Love oh, absolutely. That's incredible. And then tell us, Caleb, what is your favorite book? Great question. My favorite book is a book called Foucault's Pendulum, written by Umberto Eco, uh, who was a great Italian philosopher, one of the where they say the godfather of semiotics, which is the science of signs, which for some reason really got to me at a young age. I was so interested in symbology, but also in just the, the signs around us in life, in commercial life and in regular life, and how that makes us think and changes our behavior. And Foucault's Pendulum is just an awesome deep dive into history and biblical and, and historical signs wrapped up in a mystery with some tremendous writing. And that's been my favorite book, I don't know, for like 30 or 40, 30 years at this point in time. I, I, love, I love that it. book. On the investing side, I've written, you know, I've read so many great books over time, but, um, you know, I, I love uh, Michael Lewis. I love The Big Short, Moneyball. Um, 
and even the very first one of his uh, Liar's Poker. He's just a great author. If you want to learn about how money really works or used to work on Wall Street, Liar's Poker is a great book. And I wanted to ask you, are you familiar with George Herbert Mead? That name sounds familiar. Why does that name sound familiar? So he is a philosopher. I think he was German. And he talks about um, social behaviorism and symbolic interactionism. Wow. And I just feel like those are right in line with some of the themes that you were just talking about there. But I'm going to read what you said, and maybe we can, we can switch off in exchange. But um, so the next question is actually, uh, besides, well, actually, I'll, I'll let you say what you got to say, because, you, you know, there's some bias in the air here. But tell us, what is your favorite podcast to listen to? Well, lately, I've fallen way, way deep into the Formula One universe, and I have no business in that universe. I have never, never got into it, but I watch the Netflix show, so I'm a little bit of a, a little bit addicted to that. But in terms of the the podcast in our space that I make sure that I listen to almost all the time, I mentioned Animal Spirits, a big fan of Michael and Ben. Uh, I love what they're doing there. Um, I'm I I enjoy what uh, Troy and Rashad are doing at, at Earn Your Leisure. They have some great shows on their, uh, across their platforms. Um, Masters in Business with Barry Ritholtz. I really enjoy Barry and I enjoy his guests. That's what I listen to almost every single week. Um, and uh, those are some of my favorites, but you know, I, I also got into Mogul, really deep into Mogul. I don't know if you ever listened to Mogul and the history of hip hop and the Chris Lytle story. That was a great podcast, just if you want to do one season. And if you're a hip hop fan like I am, I just binged on that and learned so much. So it's not just business for me. Formula, a little Formula One, a little golf podcasting here and there. Uh, I also like, um, and you asked me for my favorite, I've given you four or five. I'm sorry, the rewatchables. <laughs> I love the rewatchables with uh, Bill Simmons and crew uh, from The Ringer. That, that I don't miss one of those. Those are great. Listen, man, I, I understand Cash Rules is up there too. And I know you had uh, so much to say. And we just know that Cash Rules, as well as your own podcast, is up on your list. Absolutely. Um, well. <laughs> cash, cash Rules, Cash Rules is in the playlist for sure. And you guys are doing a great job. And I'm just, like I said, just honored to be a part of it. And the Investopedia Express, you know, it's I'm 100 plus episodes deep. And the, unfortunately for my listeners, about 60 episodes ago, I started to do freestyle at the top of every show. Um, so now there's a rap at the top of every show and I can't stop myself. So uh, I'm sorry if you're coming to take a listen to it, but that's just what happens. I'm a, I'm a hip hop head and and I can't stop. I love it. I love it. So Absolutely, I, man. I hate, hate to do this to you, but I had to put you on the spot. In 30 seconds or less, promote yourself. Tell the people what you got going on next and what to look forward to. Well, we are Investopedia.com. I'm, I'm honored to be the editor-in-chief of it. My podcast, I have two, the Investopedia Express. That's every Monday. That's sort of a setup for the week and a conversation with somebody influential in our world. So that's every Monday. I have the Green Investor. If you're interested in investing along with your environmental sensibilities or want to learn what it's like to really invest in a way uh, that can actually help the planet, that's what we're exploring in the Green Investor. Investopedia is all about financial literacy and education. We've been doing this since 1999. That's 23 years. That's 230 internet years for those of you who are counting. Uh, we're <laughs> going to continue to do it. But in the next year, my goal is for us to spread our financial literacy and education into as many schools as possible. So anybody that has any connections or, or ways to help us do that, we want to give our, our content and create content for free and give it to schools so kids can get on financial literacy before they get off to college and somebody shoves a credit card uh, offer in their face or they're taking $35,000 a year at least uh, or $35,000 in student loans. We want to make sure people know what they're getting into. So that's what we're all about. And uh, like I said, we're honored to, to be on your show and, and hopefully you guys will come on ours sometime too. We'll do. We'll do. It, I look man. forward to the invitation anytime. <laughs> Absolutely. And lastly, Caleb, I mean, you've you've told us a lot about what you do and who you are. So at the end of the day, we know a lot of people are going to want to reach out to you and say, hey, what's up? But uh, yeah, where can people reach you? Yeah, I'm super easy to find. I am at Caleb Silver, C-A-L-E-B-S-I-L-V-E-R on all uh, social platforms. We are at Investopedia, easy to find. If you're looking to reach out to me directly, you can find my email on our site, but it's pretty easy to figure out uh, on the About Us page. But also you can just drop me a DM too. I'm on Twitter too much. Uh, I'm on the gram a little too much. 
And we have a great TikTok channel where I'm just doing financial education straight from the hip. I'm not playing around wearing this hat, wearing these sunglasses. I'm just trying to teach uh, in little brief lessons on TikTok. So check out Investopedia on TikTok as well. But we are everywhere. Uh, and if we're not someplace and that you spend time and you tell me about it and we'll put up a, a channel on that site as well. So that's where you can find us. Super easy to find. No, I love man. it. I love it. I love it. You're, Look, he came in. He came in. He shined. He brought in the information that's needed. I think I'm I feel well for knowledge. I feel like I'm, I'm about to spend some money out here, make some more <laughs> money and invest some more. Caleb, it was just an honor. We said you were going to do it. You came in. You proved it. Proved us right. I hope our listeners definitely listened to you, took in, absorbed all the information that you had, took some notes. Because I'm telling you, if you don't make a dollar out of anything he said, you weren't making any. They weren't making any sense listening in. <laughs> so Keith, how you feeling? I'm feeling absolutely incredible, man. The only thing that I have to say is thank you to all of the listeners for tuning in, viewers for watching. We really do appreciate it. This has been another episode of Cash Rules. Caleb, thank you, man. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure to be with you. And like they say, if it ain't about the money, don't be calling me. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Peace, everybody. See you later.